Hi everyone, um, my name is Jenny Malloy. I'm a research fellow at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology and I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you a little bit about my research and how it relates to infrastructure, decolonisation, scientific dependence and reagents. Um, so my background is molecular biology. I did a PhD in the genetic control of the dengue mosquito, um, but more recently I've worked on developing open source toolkits for manufacturing reagents, particularly in low resource contexts. Um, uh, we work with groups in Cameroon, Ghana, Ethiopia, Chile, Argentina and a number of other countries um, to try and catalyse local production of these important technologies and more recently that work has expanded into the space of diagnostics and um, for obvious reasons over the last year um, local production of these critical health technologies has also become an area of great interest um, and so we can touch on that in the Q&A but today I'll be talking exclusively about reagents that you might commonly use in your research projects. So what do I mean by scientific dependence? Well here is a commentary published in 1990 by the Beninese philosopher Paulin Huntonji, and you can see a couple of quotes where he really tries to uh, explain through a series of 13 indicators of scientific dependence um, what the colonization of primarily African countries um, has meant in terms of science and the, the introduction of modern scientific methods but only in a partial sense so so he he identifies that you know the interpretation of data that's collected in the field um, through experimental machinery and methods often still takes place outside the continent and this remains true to this day um, scientific facilities are certainly more advanced uh, than they were in 1990 and a lot more funding has been poured into the African continent, the same is true in Latin America, to develop more scientific capabilities and, and research uh, kind of facilities, but this is still a common occurrence. Um, and so he also highlights that as far as equipment is concerned, it's not only that it doesn't exist, but also that it's not produced or designed in Africa, it's designed in the global north. Um, and so there's the, the first step in the chain, as in producing the means of production, um, is also not happening locally. And so I think these, these are important points, and he goes on to expand on many, many more um, related to this idea of, of kind of the, the scientific the generation of scientific facts or the doing of science in Africa is still dependent on um, those people outside of Africa or resources from outside of Africa and and he um, thinks about how you might be able to change that situation. So we've talked about research reagents and research equipment um, but I just wanted to touch on the idea of laboratories because because we'll mention them several times during the talk <laughs> so they they form a fundamental part of what it means to do experimental biology research and and what do we mean by a lab so it's not just a room and it's not just a group of people um, but it's a formation of many many things that all work in concert to um, to analyze to produce science, to do however you want to describe it, the process of scientific um, discovery or application of research. And so um, that can be equipment, reagents, people. It can also be data moving in and out and, and also knowledge of many other forms. So these are both inputs and outputs from the laboratory. And the reason that I raise that is because um, oftentimes people are focused on quite extensively so if you look at capacity building efforts there will be a lot of training opportunities there'll be opportunities to travel abroad and train there'll be courses that are running country um, likewise data has received an awful lot of focus over the last decade in terms of how we make it available to others how we make it interoperable across data sets um, and, and a lot of kind of data science training has been um, put forward into the biology domain, which is a fantastic um, kind of uh, piece of progress. Um, PhD students and others really now have a much greater understanding of how to deal with data. Um, but hardware and reagents or access to them are vital pieces of infrastructure that I believe are often overlooked. Um, and you know, these, these are critical to doing experimental biology research. Um, but for example, even if you look specifically at the decolonization context, if you search for decolonizing knowledge in African universities, you get nearly 30,000 hits on Google Scholar. If you try the same search, but switching in laboratory equipment, only 167 hits and almost none of those are actually relevant to the topic. So 
Um, clearly, it's not received a lot of attention, um, but I'm going to try and explain in the next couple of slides why I think that it probably should receive more than it does. Um, so I won't go through all of these aspects, but here are some takeaways from interviews and surveys that I did over the last couple of years with um, molecular biologists about their access to reagents. And all of these biologists were working in Africa, Latin America or Asia. Um, and really the, the kind of key messages were that delays to their research are probably more impactful than kind of the affordability or the expense of the reagents and routine delays range from two weeks to three months. And so that really um, they felt removed some of their freedom to innovate and to kind of iterate and to get things wrong and try again. Um, and often when I say get things wrong, I mean, experiments don't work if they if we were not at the forefront of kind of where stuff is not working then we're not really doing research because we can predict the results so um so that uh that was one major theme that came out others are that there are quite a lot of monopolies i mean there are reasons why it's it's more difficult um for researchers in those locations to get access to reagents compared to somebody in north america or europe um and also that you know molecular biology enzymes they kind of seem like a very uh you know practical and uninteresting and and trivial um type of uh, object that you might find around the lab, but they actually do have quite a lot of um, kind of politics and power dynamics and trust going on around them, uh, including kind of people feeling like they have to partner with international collaborators simply in order to get access to these tools. Um, and you can imagine in that context that, you know, questioning, well, would it be helpful to actually produce the enzymes yourself um, was generally positively received, um, which was good news for our research. Um, so what happens when you're in this context of scarcity of reagents and equipment? Well, the first thing is that you may not be able to actually do anything. <laughs> so quite often I spoke to people who'd, who travelled abroad, um, learnt really high tech techniques or even what we maybe would consider in a reasonably well equipped molecular biology lab to be a very routine technique such as PCR um, and have come back and basically been unable to continue their research um, which had you know implications for their sense of self as a scientist and and their um, productivity of course um, and secondly it kind of it it's when things are broken and you're not able to get new reagents and you're not able to fix your machines the process of doing science just takes so long that it doesn't just extend the length of a project and you kind of have to justify to your funder why that happened but it also really sort of affects you and the pace and and kind of again the the productivity and the way that you view your entire program of research can alter in that context um and finally it kind of it, it's um can dampen your aspirations. So as this researcher puts it, you know, the core of debates about laboratory performance is a hidden debate about who can dream and where. Um, so this is all to say that access to equipment and reagents, I think has much broader implications than many people feel is the case. Um, and it does deserve some more attention as a critical infrastructure that we should be um, focusing on a, providing and providing sustainably with some um, local autonomy and ownership over that infrastructure. So what happens if we think about ways to turn this scarcity into abundance? And I'm going to specifically talk about um, building labs and toolkits to produce the means of production. And um, in my case, I mean the means of production of enzymes, which are one of the more challenging reagents to access um, if you're located effectively outside of an area that manufactures them. So there are many companies manufacturing enzymes in North America, in Europe, actually uh, also in China and India and other parts of Asia. Um, but Latin America and Africa have very few, if any, um, kind of local producers of these tools. And moreover, many of them have to be shipped on cold chain. So you have problems with um, the shipping being kind of not very environmentally friendly because they have to ship large boxes full of ice packs, um, but also that it uh, can often result in things melting en route and not getting to the labs in a state that they're actually usable, um, which is very frustrating if you've just waited three months or something. So um, I've been working for some time on producing a toolkit of enzymes, which is basically a collection of DNA that encodes most of the common enzymes you would find in a lab. For example, DNA polymerases that are extensively used in PCR and um, also other assays. Um, so we don't just have the enzyme 
encoding DNA itself. We also have bacterial strains and protocols for people to express them. So we run training courses um, teaching researchers how to express their own enzymes. Um, and we also view it as a kind of collection that they can build on. So we teach them how to use the collection and again, how to produce the means of production. So not only can they produce what we've given them, but they could, for example, find a local organism that is producing an interesting enzyme and put it into our backbone and vector for expression um, and, and, you know, really access that um, the information and material that we would never have conceived of. And they, if they want to, can donate that back into the collection for other people to access as well. And so we're trying to create a kind of ever growing and ever better characterized um, set of, of tools for people to produce enzymes. Um, but in theory, producing enzymes is one thing, actually producing enzymes and making it impactful in the local scientific community and and also um, providing some kind of economic return to the manufacturers is another thing. Um, and we've been working for uh, nearly two years now with Maboa Lab, which is a an open collaborative space in Cameroon, in Yonde. Um, so Maboa Lab Biotech is a spin-off, a social enterprise that we established together and it's focused on making biotech research and tools more accessible. Um, so what that looks like is running training courses for local researchers, building their own hardware. You can see here two um, transilluminators for gel electrophoresis that were built um, at the Maboa Lab and producing enzymes. Here's a gel uh, from a PCR that was run with locally produced TAC and also um, selling those enzymes to local universities. So you can see here that one of the products, Bentac, um, which is, is being sold. Um, and the next phase of that work is to look at how we can move to diagnostic applications, which basically means having a whole bunch of layers of quality assurance and quality control and trying to kind of get to the point of um, meeting international standards for diagnostics, which is a multi-year ambition, but um, that's where we're headed um, as a as a collaboration. And so here's some more photos of the lab. You can see here um, Stefan, Nadine and uh, Georgia and Manette working hard producing um, more TAC in this case. It's actually not TAC, we call it Open Vent. It's um, an open source version of Deep Vent from NEB, which is better than TAC. Um, they also have built their own shaking incubator because that was just going to be really expensive to ship. Um, so you can see in the middle there that there are um, some flasks uh, shaking inside of a Perspex box, which is being lit and heated, in fact, by um, light bulbs and controlled by a small a microprocessor at the top. Um, here's the enzymes again. Uh, so we dry them down um, into in a, in a basically a Tupperware box full of silica, which means that they last dried at room temperature um, for mon many months, four or five months at the moment. We're still doing stability uh, uh, experiments, so it may be even longer, and they work perfectly fine. Um, so this has involved a reasonable amount of adaptation and trying to adapt to local supply chains. You can he see here Lenshina um, in a soap making shop in the market in Hyundai, sourcing um, various common chemicals, ethanol, bleach, borax, uh, which is a cleaning solution, but you can also use it as a gel electrophoresis buffer, believe it or not, um, and SDS, which is used in SDS page and numerous other kind of molecular biology techniques. Um, so wherever possible and where the quality is high enough that we trust them for use in a lab context, um, we are sourcing um, chemicals and reagents locally rather than shipping them, but it does, um, it does present challenges and the market uh, is you know, restricted to basically chemicals that are used in products like soap um, and cosmetics. So it does it does limit us somewhat. There's still a lot of stuff that we have to import, um, but we're slowly trying to adapt our protocols to do that less and less over time. Um, and so this is a three way kind of collaboration. We have um, an academic uh, collaboration between my group at the University of Cambridge, Maboa Lab, University of Boya, which is another Cameroonian um, institution. Uh, producing open source technology. There's many more people that could be in that circle, but I just wanted to simplify it for the purposes of showing how the how the um, set of, of initiatives fits together. So we have academic collab collaborations to produce open source technologies, and then we have uh, groups like Beneficial Bio, which is the social enterprise that's partnering with Mobile Lab Biotech to do the implementation and scale out of those technologies into the real world. 
And then there's also ecosystem partners. So um, this doesn't operate in a vacuum. There's a need for lots of collaboration and partnerships, um, including Reclone, which is a global collaboration, specifically looking at equitable access to reagents and the Tech Access Partnership, which is a UN led initiative. Um, they're looking more into health technologies. So, so this is primarily for our diagnostics work. Um, but it's just to say that the, if you're going to actually bring this stuff to fruition, you do need a range of um, different groups helping out with that. And at all stages of this process, you have to be very mindful of who actually has the power in different um, contexts. I mean, we're talking about decolonization in this lecture. And so, um, you know, I, I would say that our initiative is not perfect in that regard. Um, and, and it's very rare to find any initiative that is. Um, and we just keep working at it and kind of being aware and talking a lot about how we do things and, and checking in and making sure that people are having, you know, a, a way, a say in shaping the, the future of our work and that it's not dominated by one group or another. Um, and so openness for us is a very core value as part of that discussion that we have around um, equity and, and, um, and around not kind of perpetuating power structures and resource structures that have um, you know, been problematic in the past. So um, we've just had some excellent explanations of what open means. I'll just kind of contextualize them in, in my project. Um, so we tried to look at open approaches quite broadly. So, I mean, particularly universal restri versus restricted access is, is at the core of what we do. So for example, availability of molecular tools that are unencumbered by intellectual property. Um, we think that's important because people should be able to pass on those tools to collaborators and also use them for commercial purposes as well, which is often not allowed in standard kind of IP protections. Um, we're interested in also having universal versus restricted participation. So greater involvement of beneficiaries in shaping projects using the tools and having more and more um, biotech researchers or researchers who want to get into biotech having the ability to actually do that science. Um, and also collaborative versus centralised production. So I already mentioned that the, the purpose of the collection is to um, enable people to do new things and hopefully share those new constructs and new enzymes and new kind of tools back into the collection for others to make use of. And so these are kind of the three aspects of openness that I think are very important in our work. Um, and I mean, openness, we've already heard, is extremely... Um, extremely broad term that means a lot of things to different people um, and the same is true of, of free so free software is uh, a kind of uh, you probably heard of open source software as a term so free software is is kind of similar but in in many cases more free <laughs> so um, in terms of it being uh, unencumbered by any uh, intellectual property restrictions so it's available to anyone for any purpose generally um, and, and Chris Kelty is a, a social anthropologist who kind of describes it as, I mean, it's a very long quote, but the, the point is that it's not a particular thing. It's kind of like it represents a whole sequence of, of different values of kind of how people might um, participate. It represents a set of responsibilities. It represents a way of being creative. Like it represents all of these different things. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, it represents some kind of utopia and a principle. Um, and it sort of it describes it being a principle made material. But those principles are are important. I think one of the principles that's attached um, very much to to open source things or openly licensed things generally um, is this idea of kind of that op openness is a route to equity. And I think that is, you know, it doesn't automatically mean that it's equitable just because you've made it open from an intellectual property, property perspective or even because you've made projects open to a participation. Making work e equitable and avoiding perpetuating problematic power structures is just a constant um, negotiation and a constant kind of reminding of yourself and, and being very open with others about that situation. Um, and so I think that it would be naive to think that open will automatically get you there because it certainly won't. But it is, I think, one of the one of the values and one of the kind of very pragmatic ways of sharing knowledge and of sharing tools that um, at least is a step in the right direction. As a takeaway, decolonization has to focus not only on knowledge, but on the means of production of knowledge. Um, and in biotechnology, that includes equipment and reagents. Um, 
Scientific dependency and scarcity of infrastructure have significant consequences and they have significant consequences for who can do science, who can shape science and also who benefits from that science. Um, and trying to kind of reduce that scientific dependency and instill greater autonomy and um, capability within uh, ecosystems of research in low middle income countries is very challenging because research and science does not exist in a bubble apart from society it is a part of these broader structures of politics of culture of economics um, and so you know I view our project as as trying to solve like one little piece <laughs> of the access to reagents and equipment problem um, i.e enzymes which is also one little piece of um, access to other sorts of infrastructure which is one little piece of this kind of whole series of other problems um, but you have to start somewhere um, and and finally you know open approaches both legal and participatory are necessary but they're not sufficient to affect increased equity and then they're not sufficient to decolonize by virtue of being open um, but they do require thoughtfulness and uh, in, intentionality and actually discussing um, the what's at the core of some of these unequal power structures and unequal partnerships to try and do something about it um, and so as I mentioned our work um, tries to foreground that in, in how we communicate with each other and think about what we're doing between the different partners and, and we certainly are always learning and always improving um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you have about that and um, thank you to my funders and also the many many people who have worked on these projects over the last few years.